Tonight we want to continue our study from last time as we ask and answer again the important question, what is license? And so let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. The Christian life as God designed it is both simple and supernatural. It is the not I, but Christ's life. Just like Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. To say it another way, 2 Corinthians 3, 5 reminds us not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of or from God. And we confess that while this truth seems self-evident, we're very slow to learn the need and the how of the abiding life of faith resting in the Lord in keeping with the grace of God. And along the way in our spiritual pilgrimage, we are ever prone to imbalance in our perspective and in our practice so that we fall off the horse of liberty into the ditch of legalism or the ditch of license. And by the way, if you no notice the picture above, you recognize that legalism results in bondage and so does license. Both emanate from the flesh. When it comes to legalism, you are bound, as it were, to the law. And in license, you're bound, as it were, to your lust. And usually, one or the other is reinforced in your life through your family upbringing and or the choices that you make so that certain patterns are developed. And as a result, that is why we must grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we've addressed legalism in the past. We're now addressing this problem of license. And in our last study, we noted the definition of license is a wrong perspective and practice which perverts the grace of God in falsely assuming that God's grace and freedom from the law is a license to sin. And that's what Jude was writing about in a... Jude 1, verses 3 and 4. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once and for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men, now watch this, who turn, who pervert, who change, the grace of our God into lewdness or license and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The word lewdness there is translated sensuality in the ESV, licentiousness in the New American Standard, license for evil in the Net Bible, license for immorality in the NIV, and that is the idea. It's something good called the grace of God resulting in something bad, namely lewdness or license to sin. You see, when you take grace and it results in license, it's been perverted. For the grace of God is designed that we might live a holy life, a life that honors the Lord, that glorifies Him, that reflects who we now are in Christ. And you see, two problems are highlighted here. Number one, this false teaching turns the grace of our God into lewdness. And number two, it denies in its teaching and practice the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the way of saying that is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You see, license tends to upplay grace and downplay holiness as if the two were not connected. 
God's grace gives us true freedom, but never freedom to sin or selfishness, which is bondage, but freedom to walk and grow and serve in grace so as to glorify Jesus Christ and to do his will. Now that's true liberty in grace. And thus license is a false teaching and practice. It perverts and distorts the grace of God. It denies practically the lordship of Jesus Christ in one's life as self is on the throne. It was a real problem in the first century and is a real problem now. It allures you through appealing to the lust of the flesh, and it especially appeals to new believers who are unestablished and especially vulnerable to this false teaching and practice, though believers in any stage of growth can be susceptible to it. You see, when embraced, license brings a person into practical bondage to the flesh, entanglement and defeat by the world, so that the believer who knows better and has the divine resources for victory in their life now acts like a dog returning to its own vomit or to a, like a pig wallowing again in the mire. And by the way, this can be true of you or me or any other believer. Maybe you know of some right away that come to your mind. They have perverted the grace of God into license. Now keep in mind that unlike license, a true understanding and application of God's grace results in a holy life, one that's separated unto God and separated from the world, one that denies ungodliness and worldly lusts, but involves an ongoing walk of faith in Christ via the word of God and humble service to others in love while looking for the blessed hope of Jesus Christ's imminent return. And if you notice closely, grace is not incompatible with holy. A holy life shows itself in a walk of faith, in humble service, in love, while looking for that blessed hope. Notice you've got faith, hope, love, grace, holy. And the key to all of this is Jesus Christ. And that is why Titus 2, verses 11 through 15 say that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, and to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because you see, he made us his own special people. He purified us, a people who are now to be zealous for good works, not to be saved, but because they're saved. As an overflow of this walk of faith in the Lord. And that's why, even as you look at the passages there, some of the key passages on license are Jude, 2 Peter 2, Colossians 3, Romans 6, Galatians 5, Titus 2. We could add 1 John 1, the book of 1 Corinthians, as they were certainly dealing with license there. A number of passages that indicate to us that license is a serious problem among believers, either in its perspective or its practice, and God wants to root this out of our thinking and deliver us from this in our lives. Do you recognize this in, our life, in your life? And by the way, this is a problem that Duluth Bible Church. Legalism is a problem. License is a problem. Mysticism is somewhat of a problem. You know why? Because we're all still carrying sin natures. We're all not all that God would want us to be. We're all in the process of growth. And we're prone to fall in these ditches. And that's why the hearing of the word of God is so important to calibrate our thinking according to his word and to who we now are in Christ. And as I think of that, I can't help but think of Colossians 2 which will set the context and flow of thought for Colossians 3, which we're going to camp on tonight. Now, beginning in verse 6 of Colossians 2, we read, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Now, interesting, that word walk in him is the first command relative to the Christian life in the book of Colossians. 
You're to walk in him just like you received Christ. How did you receive him? By faith. The emphasis here is not only on how you received him, but who you received. You not only received by faith Christ Jesus the Lord, but who you received was Christ Jesus the Lord. He was supreme. He is sufficient. He's all that you need in the Christian life, ultimately, as your Christian life really boils down to you and the Lord. It overflows in relationships, as we'll see tonight, but it all boils down to the vertical, which is the key always, to the horizontal. And so we're to walk by faith in Christ as sufficient in view of our identity in him. For we read next that we've been rooted. At the point of salvation, you got rooted in Christ, and you remain there to this day. And by the way, Christ is really good soil to grow in. Secondly, they were being built up in him. They, this is in the present tense. And this is the process. Getting built up spiritually doesn't happen overnight. It is a process. They're being built up in him, in their position in Christ. And they're getting established, again, present tense. This is, again, is a process. Established where? In the faith. And by the way, you will not be built up in him if you divorce that from the faith. And I say that because some people want to emphasize relationship, but they don't emphasize doctrine, and you can't get to the one without the other. The two go together. You're established in the faith. As you have been taught, the Spirit of God wants to teach you. God has provided pastors and teachers to teach you. You have access to a Bible. And by the way, in the busyness of the holidays, did you take some time and just read the Word of God? I was talking to a believer today. We said they just spent time reading the Word of God and how it quieted their soul in the midst of all the busyness. As you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. You see, as you're walking by faith, enjoying the Lord Jesus Christ, reveling in God's grace, rejoicing in who you are in him, you recognize I am what I am by the grace of God so that it abounds with thanksgiving in your life. Because you realize what you deserve is hell. Everything above that is the grace of God. And that you've been blessed in so many ways. You have so much to be thankful for. But isn't it funny? that we're ever so prone to see the one thing we want, we can't have, and instead of focusing on the Lord and what we have in him, we get our eyes off the Lord, get our eyes on that thing, and pretty soon now we're gr grumbling and complaining about what we don't have. Now, because we're in a spiritual battle, the Apostle Paul warned this church to beware of some things that you need to be aware of as well, and so do I. Beware lest anyone cheat you. It's an interesting word. It really means to take you captive. Or maybe we could say captivate you. This could be a friend. It could be a, uh, something on YouTube. It could be on TV, whatever. Captivates you through philosophy and empty deceit. You know, it's a certain philosophy, a way of thinking out there that doesn't line up to the Word of God, though. It's empty deceit. It offers you something, but it can't deliver what you think it can. And it's according to the tradition of man, human viewpoint. It's according to the basic principles of this world, the cosmos diabolicus. But it's not according to the truths related to Jesus Christ, the gospel, and everything that flows out of that. And having said Christ, he now mentions, for in him Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. So don't let someone sucker you down this Hansel and Gretel trail, thinking that you need something more, because you've been blessed with all spiritual blessings, plus the scriptures are sufficient, and the ministry of the Spirit of God. You don't need Jesus Christ, plus you have what you need in Christ. You don't need something more than the Word of God, really. And I say that because sometimes people, in order to fix their marriage or something, they oftentimes turn to human psychology. 
that oftentimes puts the tail on the wrong donkey, and as a result, now you approach this thing from some human viewpoint instead of from the Word of God. You're complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. Now, having mentioned you're complete in Him, he begins to now explain what that means practically, or positionally, I should say. In Him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, he's talking to both male and females here. He's not talking about something physically. He's talking about a spiritual kind of circumcision. And when what happens in circumcision is what? There is the cutting off of the flesh. And what he's saying, in essence, is what Romans 6 teaches, that by virtue of the fact that you're in Christ, you have been separated from the flesh. The flesh still dwells in you, but the sin nature's right to rule in your life has now been cut off, just like cutting off the foreskin of a penis. That is his point. Verse 12, buried with him, notice positional truth, in baptism, this is spirit baptism, you were placed into Christ, in which you also were raised. So you were, this is speaking of his death, his burial, now his resurrection. With him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh before you were saved, he has made alive together, again, notice, with him. You see, God sees you in Christ. God sees you related to Jesus Christ. And in doing so, he's forgiven you all trespasses. Now the question is, will you forgive yourself? Which actually is human viewpoint in some ways, because if the God of the universe can forgive you, who do you think you are not to? having wiped out the handwriting of requirements, namely the law, that was against us, which was contrary to us. And what did he do to the law? He took, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. That's why we don't live under legalism, as we'll see in a moment. We're not under law, we're under grace. And not only that, having disarmed principalities and power, which speaks of spirit beings, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. In it is in reference to what? The cross. As I've said before, the answer to legalism is the grace of God and the cross. And that's why even when it comes to spiritual warfare, there's a whole bunch of goofy stuff out there that is available for you to read or hear of a you know, binding Satan. You know, I read this. Binding Satan. I think, how does he keep getting out? <laughs> you know. Binding Satan. Pleading the blood. You know, where is that in the Bible? Now we're to put on the armor of God and stand and resist the wiles of the devil. And we do it in the faith, according to 1 Peter. It's real, but the way you address that is knowing, first of all, he's been disarmed. The victory's been available at the cross. And by the way, what we're covering here is positional truth. But this positional truth, as we will see, is designed to affect you conditionally. And I say that because some believers are ignorant of their position and possessions and therefore privileges in Christ. And this is why we need to read the New Testament epistles, where normally in the epistle, the first half of the epistle is usually given over to positional truth. But the second half is normally given over to conditional truth. You see, this positional truth is something we cannot afford to be ignorant of. But on the other hand, we must not be satisfied with merely knowing this, but not applying it in our condition. If I could illustrate it for a moment, it'd be like getting married. And you both say, I do. And now you're married and you say, you're married. What do you think of it? Oh, it's really wonderful. Well, that's really great. So do you live together now? No, but I want you to know we're married and it's really wonderful. Uh, do you sleep together and have intimacy? Well, no, not really. I want you to know we're married and it's really wonderful. 
Uh, do you ever communicate and have fellowship with my? No, I want you to know we don't really do that, but it's really nice to be one with my mate. And you're saying, what in the world are you thinking? That that position has not impacted your condition. And therefore, while you have this position and you have these privileges, you're not tapping into it. You're not enjoying what God wants you to enjoy. You've left it at the one and it hasn't resulted in the other. And you see, that's missing the mark of what God wants. That's why in verses 16 now through 23, he goes over three false forms of spirituality. And while we look at them, the principle we're underscoring, number one, is the teaching and application of God's grace stands in contrast to legalistic ritualism, verses 16 and 17, experiential mysticism, verses 18 and 19, personal asceticism, verses 20 through 23, as well as sinful license, chapter 3, verse 5 and following. And we're going to get to the license, but we have to get through the other three first as we follow the flow of thought. Now, verse 16 says what? Let, so let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. He's addressing what I call legalistic ritualism. Under grace, you're not under the Old Testament feasts and laws. That's ritualistic legalism. That's what that is. And we've addressed that when we've looked at the problem of legalism. We are under grace. All those things were a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. The reality is of Christ. And now in Christ, you are complete. You don't need the shadow anymore. You don't have to kiss the picture of your spouse when you're in her presence. You kiss her. Now, in verses 18 and 19, we have what's called experiential mysticism. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and the worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, though he says he has, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. Now just to give you a little working definition of mysticism, it is a false belief that encourages its adherents to possess a deeper or higher spiritual state based on some personal feelings, subjective experience, inward intuition, or extra biblical revelation. Now notice the concept of feelings here. They're big on experience. How does that make you feel? What kind of experience did you have? Or even extra biblical revelation. You see, it's interesting because the key words of mysticism are again the word feel. Experience extra-biblical revelation. They're not using the Word of God. Now it's the Bible plus their experience. I'll give you just a quick example of that. It's like being slain in the Spirit, people falling over backwards in these Pentecostal, charismatic... Where is that in the Bible? It's not. It's extra-biblical. Or even speaking in tongues today. You know... Tongues were the ability to speak in a known foreign language apart from the learning process. It wasn't the gibberish that you hear today. It served a purpose in the early church, but that purpose has been served. Just like of the 20 spiritual gifts, 10 of them were temporary and 10 of them are permanent. But people today think, well, I must be filled with the Spirit. I'm speaking in, quote, tongues. 
You know, and they violate usually the principles of the word of God relative to tongues when it was legitimate in the first century. You know, next time someone does that, just say, really, what language were you speaking? Experience is very big. Extra biblical revelation. You know, this comes in a lot of different forms. You know, the Bible plus my dreams. The Bible plus my experiences. The Bible plus whatever. In fact, you know, even books like uh, Jesus is Calling, today, in which the author writes in the first person as if it's God speaking to you, like she is the channel for this, is extra biblical revelation. And though there's things in there that are true, the whole approach is she acts as some medium between you and God. Very problematic. If you notice closely in the Bible, the word know is found over 1,300 times. The word feel is found nine times. The word truth is found 223 times. The word experience is found three times. The word faith is found some 245 times. The word experience and feel is just 12 times. Where does the Bible put the emphasis? On knowing the truth and walking by faith regardless of how you feel. And we're to beware, verse 8 tells us, of these very problems of legalistic ritualism, experiential mysticism. And you see, one of the down, bottom line problems of mysticism, verse 19, it's not holding fast to the head. It doesn't hold fast to Jesus Christ. It puts the emphasis on the Holy Spirit, whose objective is to glorify Christ. It puts the emphasis on your experience instead of Jesus Christ, from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. And then thirdly, there is asceticism. Personal asceticism. In verses 20 through 23, I give you a little working definition again. Asceticism is the false belief that the blessings of God and the sanctifying of the soul comes from the discipline of the body. The discipline of the body. Notice verse 20. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, hang on to that. Why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations, human regulations? To be spiritual is the idea. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. Notice these regulations tend to be negative, externals, which all concern things which perish with the using, like food or drink or something else, according to the commandments and doctrines of man. Show me it in the word of God. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion and false humility and neglect of the body but in reality, they are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. In other words, they're still exalting the flesh. They're not what true spirituality is all about. You say, well, what is true spirituality all about? Well, true spirituality, as we will see, is about Jesus Christ, how you're thinking and relating to him. For in chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, we see that the teaching and application of God's grace in contrast to sinful license exhorts you to seek Christ in heavenly realities and to set your mind on things above in light of your new position, identity, security, and future glory in Christ. We see in Colossians 3 verse 1, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Why? For you died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your, our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, when you look at this passage, there's one word that's found four times in four verses. Do you know what word it is? Christ. 
Christ, Christ, Christ. You see, true spirituality revolves around, again, your relationship, your walk with Jesus Christ. Secondly, it revolves around your position in him. If then you were raised with Christ, the word if is in the first class condition, it assumes a reality from the standpoint of the speaker because it is a reality or for the sake of argument. In this case, it's a reality. They're believers. If then you were raised with Christ, and you are. But, you know, for years I didn't know it because of the chapter division. Chapter 2, verse 20. Look there with me. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, da-da-da-da-da, chapter 3, verse 1, if then you were raised with Christ. So again, we're right back to positional truth. If you died with Christ and you did from the basic principles of the world, and if you were raised with Christ, therefore, you are to live this way. This is positional truth encouraging conditional response. Now, you know, it's amazing because I've taught positional truth for years and years, and my understanding has in increased, just like yours probably has. And sometimes people finally catch on in some ways, and, and, and they're like, wow, they, it's like they've never seen this before. And they and sometimes assume no one else has ever seen it either. Not true. And while it's true that we should have greater levels and newer levels, perhaps, of understanding, one of my prayers over the years has been, Lord, I want to understand more what my position in Christ means and what it means in my daily life. And that's what Paul's covering here. Now, the third thing I want you to observe is there's two commands in these verses. Can you find them? What's the first one? Seek. What's the second one? Set. Technically, set your mind is all one word. Okay? Seek. That's the first command. If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. See, being raised with Christ doesn't mean just resurrected with him, but it means ascended, seated, as it were, in the heavenlies in Christ, Ephesians 2, 7. And so let this heavenly position in Christ impact you with a heavenly perspective while you live your life on earth. Seek those things which are above. Where Christ is above. Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, the place of exaltation above. Now the word seek is a present active imperative. It's not talking about, you know, just seek this once and you're locked in. I sure wish spirituality is you were locked in. I sure wish you just locked in and you never got out, right? Not true. If that was the case, it wouldn't be a relationship either, would it? Relationships are dynamic. They involve repeated choices. Seek, active voice, you have to choose this, imperative mood. This is a must. Seek those things which are above. Seek those things which are above. The things which are above are Jesus Christ. Heavenly realities. Your spiritual inheritance. You have a home in heaven. You have divine resources to live a life for the glory of God. And then, number two, set your mind. Another present active imperative. Set your mind, your thinking. Where? On things above. See, the Christian life all revolves around what's going on between your ears. It's your thinking. Your mental occupation. Occupying your mind with Jesus Christ via the word of God. Relating to him in your life. Could be, you know... Thinking about a singing a song in your heart, it could be a verse, it could be a truth, it could be whatever. You're, you're setting your mind on things above. Now notice the contrast, above, not on things on the earth. 
Now, this doesn't mean, obviously, as we go through our day, we don't have to consider and concentrate on what's at hand. You know, there used to be a saying, he's so heavenly minded that he's no earthly good, but I haven't heard that in years. Because I don't think too many believers are all that heavenly minded. Instead, Paul warns in Philippians 3, 19, of those who set their minds on earthly things. And one of the things you have to come to grips with as a believer is this. That apart from a right vertical relationship with God, man is miserable and life is meaningless. And if you're not walking with the Lord, enjoying fellowship with Him, you're going to live an empty life, a meaningless life, and you're going to start going down one dead-end street after another, thinking that if I only can have that, then I'll really be happy. And you're going to miss it. You're going to go down the relationship of maybe a career or, or, or a, you know, the dead-end street of a career, dead-end street of a relationship, dead-end street of alcohol or sex or something to satisfy the flesh because you are empty on the inside when only Jesus satisfies. And that's what they sang tonight, right? We saw that at salvation. We saw that Jesus Christ satisfied the longing of my soul. Why is it we look in other places then for it to be found somewhere else later on? Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't enjoy your marriage. You, you can and should, but that should be true as a result of walking with the Lord and trusting in Him as my expectation is only from Him. Psalm 62 and yes, indeed, he wants to use my mate to minister to my needs as well as to use me to minister to her needs. But I'm not looking to them. I'm looking to the Lord for what I stand in need of. And I'm finding my joy in him for the joy of the Lord is my strength. Now, why should we be daily focused on Christ, seeking our relationship with him and setting our minds on things above we have three reasons in verses 3 and 4. One deals with your past, one deals with your present, the other deals with your future. 4 gives us an introduction to the reasons. 4, number 1, you die. This is an aorist indicative. This isn't something you do to yourself. This is something that's already happened to you when you were saved. You died with Jesus Christ. You're no longer in Adam. You are now in Christ. You're separated from being in Adam. And your identification is now with Christ as a new creation in him. And in doing so, you died to the sin nature. You died to the world. And you died to Satan all in Christ. You've been separated from the ruling power in your life. And number two, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now the word hidden is in the perfect tense. It was hidden at the moment you're saved, and the result is it remains hidden to this day. Now where is it hidden? It's hidden with Christ, and it's hidden in God. You know, when I see those two phrases, I think of a safe deposit box inside of a safe. <laughs> what do you people put in safe deposit boxes? Something of value. And where do those deposit boxes, where are they found? They're inside of the safe. So to get at that, you'd have to get through, first of all, the safe, and then through the safe deposit box in order to finally hold what you were looking for. Do you know this speaks of your security? The first speaks of your identity. This now speaks of your security. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. And if that wasn't enough, now he speaks of your future. And whenever is the idea. The word when literally means whenever. Christ appears. And we don't know when he's going to appear. But you know what, dear saints? He could appear today. He could come and capture you away today. In fact, again, as I shared on Sunday night, I never thought I would ever see 2019 when I was saved in 1973. I thought for sure the rapture would have happened by now. No, that doesn't mean I've lost any faith in the reality of the rapture. Just because God's timetable isn't the same as mine. 
Because the 11th attribute of God is God is slow. Have you noticed? Slow. At least in our time. But whenever Christ appears, and Christ is our life, by the way, then you also will appear with him. Why? Because you are related to him. So at the rapture, you meet the Lord in the air, and then at the second coming, you are with him, riding on white horses to come back as he's going to rule and reign on the earth. And you know who you're connected with? Jesus Christ. And you're connected... You will appear with him in glory. By the way, you take away Jesus Christ and the gospel from this equation, and it doesn't make sense. All three reasons are directly connected to your position or identity in Christ. Again, if I could illustrate this, it would be like, again, visualizing this is Christ and this is you, and before you're saved, you're separated from Christ. When you are saved, the Spirit of God puts you in union with Jesus Christ. So you died with Christ. He died, you died with him. Your life is hidden now with Christ in God. And when he appears, you also will appear with him in glory. But frankly, you have to take that by faith because you didn't experience any of it. The point of faith, you say, the second, oh, I'm dying with Christ. Okay, I think I've just been raised. And I'm, I'm, I'm ascending. I'm seated. Man, hey, oh. you don't know. You didn't feel any of it. You have to take it by faith. And you didn't even know it happened. Unless it was from the word of God that you learned it, you wouldn't even have known that. You can't feel it, but it's a fact. It's not an experience, but it's a reality. It's not mechanical or mystical, but it's relational. And it's not about self. It's all about Christ, unlike license. In fact, as I was thinking of this truth today, I was reminded of this old song, I am his and he is mine. You know that song? Love with everlasting love, led by grace that love to know, Gracious spirit from above, thou hast taught me, it is so. Oh, this full and perfect peace, oh, this transport all divine. In a love which cannot cease, I am his, and he is mine. Things that once were wild alarms cannot now disturb my rest. Closed in everlasting arms, pillowed on the loving breast. Oh, to lie forever here. Doubt and care and self resign. While he whispers in my ear, I am his. He is mine. His forever only his, who the Lord in me shall part. Ah, oh, with what a rest of bliss. Christ can fill the loving heart. Heaven and earth may fade and flee, firstborn light of gloom decline. But while God and I shall be, I am his. He is mine. Wow. That person saw his identity, his security, his future glory wrapped up in his relationship with Jesus Christ. And you know, the Bible, dear friends, is incredibly balanced. God knows our tendency to imbalance into legalism or license. And by the way, that's the value of teaching the Bible verse by verse. I don't have to be smart enough to know how to cover everything. As I just teach verse by verse, it balances it. We've just seen ritualistic legalism. We've just seen experiential mysticism. We've just seen personal asceticism. And all these are false forms of spirituality. But so that people don't misunderstand grace, he now addresses, beginning in verse 5, the problem of personal license. And thus, principle number three, the teaching and application of God's grace in contrast to sinful license exhorts you to now take responsibility to put to death personal sins of perverted love in your life since you died with Christ in regards to sin and the world. 
You see, in verses 5 through 10, he's going to address some things God wants us to, verse 5, put to death. Or in verse 9, to put off. You see, there are certain things God wants put to death or put off regarding personal sins in our life. Now, the key to that is having victory over the source of sin, the sin nature. This is where Romans 6 and 7 and 8 come in. But flowing out of that nature are sins or human good. And in verse 5, we're dealing with some sins of what I'm going to call perverted love. In light of your position, identity, security, and future glory in Christ, now live in light of your union with Christ so that you have communion. In light of your unchanging position in Christ, allow this to impact your changing condition each day. Let your standing affect your state. And by the way, the two will not be one fully in harmony until the day you're in glory. But there's to be progress and victory and joy. Now he says in verse 5 what? Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now that phrase, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, needs some clarification. You know, at first glance it looks like you're to put to death your members. Put to death your, your hand and your, your arm and your leg and your mouth and your ear. Put it to death. And how do you do that? Or you just go and you cut them off, right? No, obviously not. You see, this is what's called a uh, metonymy. It's a, it's a literary device in which one representative term stands in for something else. A metonymy is a figure of speech in which something is called by a new name that is related in meaning to the original thing or concept. Now let me give you some examples. Like, the pen, the pen is mightier than the sword. The word pen is a metonymy for a thought or reason. Is mightier than the sword, and the word sword represents military warfare. So notice, without stating exactly what it is, something else is used that communicates it. And we do this oftentimes. For example, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Did he really mean cut off your ears and give them to me? Well, no. In other words, listen to me. Or we hear, don't get your values from Hollywood. What do we mean? From the cinema industry. Or there came an executive order from the White House. White House? Which White House? Well, the word White House represents what? The president, right? Or many people like to eat at the Golden Arches. The Golden Arches are where? McDonald's, right? McDonald's. Right? We're expecting new product from the Silicon Valley. What's the Silicon Valley represent? The technology. Or we just did time in the big house. <laughs> really, what's the big house? Well, that's prison. But instead of using the word prison, we use the word big house. Or he is a friend of the crown. Is it really the crown or is it really the person in authority like the king? Or how about this? Let me give you a hand. When's the last time you actually gave a hand to somebody? You've never done it in your life. What we mean by that, though, is the hand represents what? Help, right? Assistance. That's called a metonymy. So when we read, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, the word your members is a metonymy for the sins or deeds which come from the sin nature using your bodily members. Now this is not a direct reference to Romans 6, 11 through 13. Though, indeed, we're to reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus, and let not 
sin reign in our mortal body. We're to yield ourselves to the Lord. That is true. And that's going to be part of the how this is fulfilled. But this is probably more in reference to Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Live a life out of fellowship with God. But if by the Spirit, so very important, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Notice, you don't put to death the body, but the deeds of the body. And the deeds of the body are those sinful deeds that emanate from the body when the body is being utilized by the sin nature. So that's the idea here. And the way to do this, again, is through the power of the Holy Spirit in light of your position in Christ. Now, having said that, we examine verse 5. Therefore. Now, what does therefore do? Points you back to what you've just read. It points you back to the fact that you died with Christ, that you were raised with Christ, that your life is hidden with Christ in God, that you're to seek those things that are above, not on the earth. Therefore, put to death your members. And the word put to death is interesting. It's, a, it's an imperative again, something you are responsible to do. You are not a victim when it comes to these sins. You, it's not, I, can't, I just can't help myself. No, you're responsible, though it is true that you may not know how to have victory. Paul, while recognizing Romans 6 and Romans 7, says the things I want to do, I don't do. Things I don't want to do, I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. He says, that the will is present, but how to perform that which is good? I don't know how to do it. But in either case, we are still responsible. One of the problems believers have under license kind of thinking is that they don't hold themselves responsible for their choice. They think they are somehow a victim. And even if you've been victimized, you're not a victim. You're making choices. You go down a carnal road. Do you expect spiritual fruit? What are you thinking? But again, tendency is to think I'll be the exception, or pretty soon you don't care. God has to divinely discipline you in order for you to care again, or it could be that in order for you to finally make some decisions, he has to let you get wrung through the ringer, as it were. Put to death your members which are on the earth. Again, notice in contrast to seeking those things that are above. Now notice what he says. What are these sins that God wants to eliminate, as it were, in your life? First one is fornication. It's the Greek word pornea. Now, it speaks of sexual sin in a general sense. Sexual sin in a general sense. Sexual morality. See, license takes the liberty of sex reserved for marriage to that which is sinful before or during marriage. This refers to premarital sex. This can refer to adultery, homosexuality, bestiality, incest. According to Galatians 6 15 or 5 19, it is a work of the flesh. And by the way, it's interesting in scripture. According to Matthew 19 and Matthew 5, that it's a ground for divorce. It's very interesting. Now, there's a lot of sins that can be committed in a marriage. And just because they're not grounds for divorce doesn't mean they're right. They're wrong. And by the way, if you think because, well, she can't divorce me or he can't divorce me as long as I don't commit adultery, that therefore you don't need to invest into your marriage, you've made a serious mistake. On the other hand, I hear of believers today who say, well, I don't really have grounds, but I'm going to do it anyhow. Well, you know what? That's licensed thinking. Self is on the throne. I'm calling the shot. I'm doing it my way. Now, there's other options for that. There are times when separation may be legitimate, especially in case of physical abuse and such. That may be true. 
But what does the Bible say here? Fornication. And why is it that God allows, he doesn't command, but allows divorce in that case? Well, so often with fornication, there's deceit and there's this total breakdown of trust. So you, you don't trust the person anymore. And that's huge. Second one is uncleanness. Now, uncleanness is talking about what's going on on the inside while fornication is going on on the outside. It speaks of impure thoughts. Perverted fantasies. This is where porn can come in. Sex texting. And Frank, you know, to the life of me, I cannot understand it. And you might say this is a generational gap. I cannot understand for a moment why someone would take pictures of themselves and their nakedness and send it to someone. I just can't understand that at all. The flesh is the flesh is the flesh. And I will tell you this, and I'll just say this to you parents. You know, if you have a daughter, for example, who is unmarried and some guy's interested in her, in light of the culture we live in, it's pretty safe to assume that if they're not saved, or even if they're saved, they're not walking and growing in the Lord, they're viewing your daughter primarily as a sex object. And that's why they're not thinking in terms of, can we get together and pray? Are you kidding me? They're not thinking that way at all. They're thinking in terms of, what can I get, not what can I give? They're not thinking about, how can I lead this woman into holiness and, and, and make sure I guard her testimony? They're not thinking that way at all. They're thinking in terms of indulging their flesh. That's what they're thinking of. And that's why you're very wise to say, hit the road, Jack. Sounds like a song or something. Passion. Passion speaks of uncontrolled, lustful passions. Uncontrolled, lustful passions. Evil desire speaks of wicked desires or cravings for that which you know is wrong. And then covetousness, which is, speaks of greed or a desire to have more. Which, by the way, which is idolatry. And normally we would never put a covetousness and idolatry in the same sentence, but God does. Because you see, when you're covetous, you're not content with what you have. And now you are pursuing and bowing down and putting first a person or a thing in your life instead of Jesus Christ. And by the way, you do not have the liberty to do this without it being a sin of perverted love. You know, when people have the attitude, I am entitled to have or do this, that is Satan's lie. And when you, quote, fall in love with another person who's not your mate, you have violated the word of God. I remember years ago, many years ago, sitting down with a lady who was having an affair. And she said to me, she said, God made me to love and be loved. And therefore, this is legitimate because I'm not getting this from my husband. And you know, if, if you would meet her today, she is an absolute apostate. And the guy she was having with the affair with ended up being a drunk for 30 years after it. Dealing with the guilt of that and who knows what else. You know, Satan wants to destroy you. And one of the things he does is he tempts you regarding perverted love. And as I've said so many times, the sins of the culture become the sins of the church. And that is why there are numerous passages regarding this in the Bible. Proverbs 6, 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20. Hebrews 13, 4. 
And you know, he that covers his sin shall not prosper, who confesses and forsakes shall have mercy. That is why Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn thee, what? Go and sin no more. He didn't say go and exploit the grace of God. He didn't say that. And remember, to be tempted is not sin. Temptation yielded to is sin. So license is prone to justify these sins. Well, you know, I had a bad marriage. Or license is prone to reject correction. You're telling me this is wrong, you legalist? Wait a second. The Bible's telling you it's wrong. License is prone to downplay these sins. Well, everyone is doing it. You're not everyone. You're a child of God. You have the spirit of God. You are the temple of God. This is wrong. Now, it's one thing to slip into these sins or to fail here and realize it's wrong and want it to be corrected. It's another thing to justify the thing. And we can get just desensitized to it because it's nothing new. We've watched it how many times on the internet or whatever, you know, even in legitimate movies. Suddenly you watch these family movies and all of a sudden this scene comes on. And you know, we fast forward through it or whatever and my wife goes, my wife almost always says, they didn't need to have that. And I said, I know, they didn't. They didn't need to have that. They didn't enhance the movie at all. But you get desensitized. Or you don't put up appropriate boundaries. Well, we're just friends. Or you don't take this seriously. And the fact is you play with fire, you're going to get burnt. And that is why our fourth principle, and this will be our last one tonight, the teaching and application of God's grace in contrast to sinful license never excuses, downplays, or justifies personal sins but recognizes their seriousness as they bring God's future judgment upon the unsaved, while also reminding you to not forget your own past practice and present possibilities. Verse 6 says, Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. <clears throat> Notice this, because of these things, what things? These sins. The wrath of God is coming upon the sins of disobedience. These are sins. Call it what it is. I was talking to someone recently, and they said, well, I've made some mistakes. And I said, mistakes? No mistakes, those are sins. Call it for what it is. And by the way, they are serious God rained fire and brimstone down on Sodom and Gomorrah due to sexual sin. It's serious. And by the way, when it comes to sin, do you realize sin is so wrong, so destructive, that only the death of Jesus Christ could pay for it? Why would we downplay the seriousness of sin which caused our Savior to go to the cross? The wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. By the way, the sons of disobedience, according to Ephesians 2.2 2 and 5.6, are the unsaved. They disobey the gospel. They don't put their faith in Christ, and they live in ongoing rebellion. In which sins you yourselves once, the word means previously, or in the past, walked when you lived in them. You see, believer, number one, take these sins seriously. Christ had to die for them. God wants them eliminated, as it were, in our lives. And they bring upon the unsaved the wrath of God. Because of the rejection of Christ. Therefore, they die in their sin. Secondly, be grateful for the grace of God because Jesus Christ is your propitiation and that propitiation was applied when you believed in Christ. Thus you have escaped the wrath to come. You once 
lived in them. I once lived in them. You've lived in them. This is what was true before people are saved. And you expect the unsaved to live like the unsaved. The problem is when believers are living like the unsaved. That's the problem. And by the way, you live this way, you indulge your flesh, you're going to reap what you sow in whom the Lord loves. He's going to chasten, and he's going to take you to the woodshed. And you know, a lot of times the way he does it, he just lets you reap what you sow. But thirdly, don't forget the pet from which you've been dug. Don't forget this is how you previously lived and could still possibly live because he's not telling them to put to death these sins because they weren't capable of doing them. Either they were doing them or they were at least possibilities in their lives. Why tell these believers to put these sins to death if they were incapable of still doing them? And thus, think in terms of the fact that by the grace of God I've been delivered apart from the grace of God, so now go I. You are capable of anything in the catalog of sin. Given enough time and the right situation, you're just a decision or two away from going down the wrong path already. And that's why I need thee every hour. That's why walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the loss of the flesh. That's why I realize God has something better for you. To walk with Jesus Christ, to enjoy this heavenly position you have in him. To set your minds on things above, not on things on the earth. And to live a life that now glorifies him and fulfills the plan of God and isn't encumbered by these things that destroy our fellowship and destroy our testimony and destroy our relationships and pervert that which God intended to be good. And you might be listening to me right now tonight, and if you're not taking this seriously, you're making a very big mistake. Because there's nothing really in this world that's going to encourage you to go in the right direction apart from the word of God. Our whole world flaunts license and can be found everywhere. They tolerate every kind of sin, basically, except someone saying this is wrong. That they do not tolerate. And therefore, whether you realize it or not, and I see this even with our younger folks. They've been far more defiled by the world than they think. And that's why we need the washing of the water of the word of God so that our feet are clean and we can walk in a way that's honoring to the Lord because he keeps calibrating our thinking. Otherwise, what happens is they think they're going to be the exception or it's not going to really bite them that hard or they think they can get away with it or they think that they, again, it won't be all that bad. And then when it all hits the fan, their lives are scarred and their souls are hurt and their testimony is ruined and on and on we go. And God said, I had a better plan for you. But in your arrogance, your pride, your rebellion, you went your way. And yet, you know what's so amazing? Is God is still willing to meet you where you're at. to get you where he wants you to be. That's the faithfulness and grace of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Frankly, when I see believers engaging in these things and not taking your word seriously, it's heart-wrenching. I recognize, Father, we're all by your grace, what we are. But we recognize also it doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to succumb to the works of the flesh because we have the Holy Spirit and we have a position in Christ. And these sins can be eliminated. We can have victory over these sins in our life because we can have victory over the very nature that produces these sins as we hide your word in our heart and we walk by faith Christ in our life, and we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. And when we do sin against you, 
we can be quick to confess it and claim the forgiveness so that we keep short accounts with you. Lest sin gets stacked upon sin upon sin and a sin, and pretty soon we've just gone down this dead end street that is so destructive. Everyone involved. And we know that you have something better, but we also know, because you're a perfect gentleman, that just like at salvation, you did not force us to believe. You will not force us to respond to you either. But you appeal to us. You even command us. But we know it's a volitional choice because it's a relationship of grace. And so, Father, may we take these things to heart, I pray, and Apply them in our lives now, and even direct with our time of prayer to follow. In Jesus' name. Well, Lord willing, we'll pick this up this Sunday morning as we work our way through.